Hi everyone, thanks for coming to the talk and thanks a lot to the organizers and, and, and PC for uh, bringing all of us together. Um, so today I'm going to present a work uh, with my co-authors Zoe, Kopi, Rolando and Yit. Um, even though recently some of us moved to other places, this was a work done completely at Los Alamos National Lab. Um, and the topic is quantum algorithms from fluctuation theorems, you know, for use generating thermal states. Um, but just as a disclaimer, we will see much less fluctuation theorems compared to the original paper. So if you want to see the inspirations from the fluctuation theorems, you probably better go to the paper. Uh, but I will try to highlight a few things from there as well. Um, well, just a little bit of motivation. Many problems in physics, chemistry, and biology, they involve preparing quantum thermal state that, that goes beyond only ground states. And we know that classical algorithms suffer from the famous sign problem. Um, and non-quantum algorithms suffer from a prohibitive scaling um, with the Hilbert space dimension. Uh, we will see what this means. And in fact, this is the part that we will try to improve, um, improve in this talk. Um, to state the problem, we are given a Hamiltonian H and a inverse temperature beta, and we want to prepare um, an approximation to this state. Um, but since we are operating with a quantum computer, we actually want to prepare an approximation to, the, to this particular purification. Um, and if you look at this state and trace out the second party, uh, you can easily see that we, we end up with this state. Um, I'll introduce a diagrammatic notation, just so that some parts of the talk we will need to um, prove things in code. Um, this may be familiar to you from either quantum information or tensor networks. This state denotes the maximally entangled state in a Hilbert space um, of dimension n. So this is, you know, double Hilbert spaces. And when we act with an operator O in the first leg or in the first party and with an identity in the second party. This is how we show this. So it's right hand side is what happens, but left hand side is how we show this. Um, and we know this identity where we can carry this operator in the first leg to the second leg by taking the transpose of it, which we show it by this. And at some points we will also use the hermeticity of this operator because the operators that we will be interested in will be Hermitian. Um, and sometimes you will also see the, the, the complex conjugate of, the, of these operators. And a useful warm-up is the thermal state itself. Um, we can obtain the thermal state or the purification of the thermal state at inverse temperature beta with respect to Hamiltonian H by acting with this operator on the, on the maximally entangled state. Um, and this is our target, target state, which is the purification of the thermal state. But importantly, we get this pre-factor. Uh, so what do previous approaches do to, to tackle this problem? They first start uh, from this purification of the infinite temperature state. It is easy to prepare. It's just n, which is you know log big n of um, bell pairs. And then we block encode this operator e to the minus beta h over 2. So you get rescaled by this factor alpha, such that this operator is unitary. And when you apply this um, on your initial state, what you get is uh, your target state with some amplitude and some garbage. And eventually, um, you basically amplify this amplitude by um, reflecting around this ancilla zero that flags the good part of the state and, and by, this, by this state. The number of amplitude amplification rounds basically is inverse of this number. Um, and in fact, we, you know, we can see these, we can understand these two previous papers in, in these lines. Um, this is the ratios of the square root of the ratios of the partition functions, which is basically inverse of this quantity. And this is the inverse of al uh, one over alpha. So it's this alpha in these settings. So this is the number of amplitude amplification rounds that you need um, 
or that they, they needed in their algorithm. And each amplitude amplification round calls um, Hamiltonian evolution by, by the Hamiltonian itself, which is not the bottleneck of the algorithm, but I still put, it, put those expressions. But this can be done, uh, done efficiently. So what we really want to do is we want to improve, um, we want to see whether we can improve these numbers. And if you think about it, you know, what's really going on in these algorithms, you're starting from at the infinite temperature state, and you're applying an operator that carries this infinite temperature state to the, to the inverse temperature beta state, which you didn't have to do it in this way in principle. Um, and you can ask yourself whether we could start from another thermal state that's not at the infinite temperature, but, but at some other temperature, one over beta zero, uh, and in principle, we didn't need to use the same Hamiltonian. We could start from another Hamiltonian H0. And that if hopefully this state is easy to prepare, then we can reflect um, around this state or prepare this state in our amplitude amplification rounds easily. And then if there is an operator that maps us from this state to this state, um, then we would use that operator in, in the subroutine of our algorithm. And hopefully, um, it's much easier to implement a unitary version of this operator rather than this operator. I mean, if you physically think about this, here you are starting from the infinite temperature state, and intuitively it feels like this is going to take much longer time than potentially something like this. Um, without loss of generality, we can you know, rescale H0 and make these inverse temperatures the same, and the problem gets reduced to... Um, mapping this thermal state to this thermal state. And we are particularly interested in the case where H1 is expressed as H0 plus V. And we expect if the norm of V is much less compared to the original Hamiltonian or the target Hamiltonian, then we expect to get our scaling with the norm of V rather than norm of any of these major Hamiltonians. So let's just see this result um, that, that we will show. Uh, we still get the ratios of the partition functions, but as you see, we potentially get a significant improvement here because we are starting from the, um, not from the infinite temperature state, but from, uh, from another state whose partition function is zero, which in principle may be much less than the total Hilbert space dimension. So this is first improvement we get, and the second improvement we get is we do not scale with the norm of the original Hamiltonian, but we get scaled with the perturbation V, norm of the perturbation V, which is intuitive because here we are bypassing preparing this state, and we are saying that we are not going to prepare this state from the infinite temperature state, but we know a quantum circuit that actually efficiently prepares this state by itself. Um, okay, how do we do this? We still need an operator that carries us from here to here, which we will then block encode and, and implement in a, in a quantum circuit. Um, so here's one option that doesn't work. We could first apply e to the beta 0, h0 over 2, um, and then we could apply this operator that would carry us to, the, to, to our target, but the problem with this is that this is actually carrying us first to the infinite temperature and then bringing us back to the target, which, you know, doing actually making things much worse because this was what original approaches were doing anyway. So we don't want to do this. Uh, what we want to do is that we want to find an operator that sort of directly carries us from this point to this point. Um, and one... Another approach that we tried, that we, whether we could express the product of these operators in such a way that um, that expansion, the norm of that expansion, actually scales with exponential with the norm of V, which we couldn't manage to do. Um, but there's a solution to this. And the solution is uh, using what is called the work operator um, in, the, in the context of fluctuation theorems. Um, but it is easy to understand, so we don't need to go there. What we do is, basically, we carry one of these operators, one of these boxes, to the other copy. So this is now the, what we call the exponential of the work operator, 
or sometimes just exponential operator. And let's just see whether this state actually brings us to the target state that we want to that we want to end up. Here is the proof. This state is proportional to this state. Uh, here there is an identity, so we can carry this box to here, which we obtain here, this way, um, this state. Uh, and this box we can carry to the first leg um, by taking the transpose. So, and then they cancel each other, because one, one of them comes with e to the beta h0, the other one comes with e to the minus beta h0. And then we end up with a state that is proportional to the thermal states at inverse temperature beta with respect to Hamiltonian 1, which is, which is the target state that we want. Um, to be exact, um, this is what this operator does. We start from the initial state psi 0, and when we apply this operator, we get our target state with, with this proportionality factor. But we still need to block encode this operator, e to the minus beta w over 2. Um, and in fact, the block encoding of this operator may still dampen, you know, we can still get a scaling factor alpha that scales exponentially with the full, uh, full norm of the Hamiltonian. So we don't want to do that. And the rest of the talk is in fact about understanding this alpha, how, how we can improve this. Um, and, and get something that scales with norm of V rather than norm of the full Hamiltonian. Okay, this is what we, what we just said. We are not doing this. Instead, we are trying to come up with an operator X that um, still approximates this operator, the exponential operator, work operator itself, but um, only in the work values in the subspace of this work operator W, where the eigenvalues are greater than this number WL. Um, and below WL, we basically say that, well, maybe it doesn't matter for this specific task if we approximate this operator within this subspace well enough or not. In fact, that's the very definition of WL. WL is the number in such a way that this task can still be done with epsilon approximation, but part of the operator we can just miss and, and it's not going to affect the result. So to be more precise, um, what we are trying to do is that we are trying to approximate a function, approximate the function e to the minus x. But what we are doing is, uh, and, and as you notice, most of the norm of this function is coming from um, the values, the, the, the most negative values. So if we can approximate this function with this function, with hx, below this value wl, um, then the rescaling factor that we are going to get in our quantum algorithm will be much less. And for this task, th this is the very definition of wl. wl is the, that work value um, in such a way that when e to the minus beta w over 2 were, was acting on the initial thermal state, um, it is totally fine to ignore the, the part, the subspace of the work values that is less than WL. Uh, and in fact, if this is already order relative error epsilon, we can get away with order one error um, for approximating e to the minus x here. Uh, and then we're still going to approximate this operator in this subspace uh, with, with relative error epsilon. Then when these conditions are satisfied, we, uh, we still perform the task with epsilon approximation. Okay, so, yeah. The improvement is now, as, as I mentioned, now we get the ratios of the partition functions here. Um, and instead of getting the norm of the Hamiltonian, we get something that scales as this work cutoff value WL. I will come to what this, what this value is uh, a bit later. Um, let's just go through how to implement this operator um, very quickly. This is not the bottleneck, but let me just mention. We have this, op this function, hx. Um, we take the Fourier transform, we discretize and truncate this. Eventually, this brings us to a form that is a linear combination of unit trees, where unit trees are Hamiltonian evolution with respect to the work operator, which can be expressed as the Hamiltonian evolution with respect to the target Hamiltonian and the and the initial Hamiltonian. So this is easy to perform. 
in a quantum computer, and this number j is basically the number of calls that we make to this, uh, to this unitary operator, which is what you see here. Um, okay, this is the algorithm that I already explained. Uh, we assume that we are given an estimate or a bound on the maximal work cutoff value WL. Um, we write down, um, thank you. We write down a block encoding of this operator X, um, and then we basically iterate this amplitude amplification with amplitude amplification rounds uh, of this many. Um, and now you wonder what is this WL, right? We define this and so on, but but I never told you what this is. Um, for general Hamiltonians, we found that it's we can pick WL that scales linearly with the norm of V and, and 1 over epsilon. Um, if the Hamiltonians are commuting, things are much better. We don't scale with 1 over epsilon at all. And if the Hamiltonian is k-local and, um, and has some finite degree, um, then the scaling with the error it gets actually much better, which is you know, from 1 over epsilon to log 1 over epsilon. So, so you put you know, whatever your Hamiltonian that you're interested in, um, you can put all these numbers here. The C is going to be different for different scenarios. Uh, it's in general linear in 1 over epsilon, but, but sometimes it's much better. Okay, so, so can we improve things more? Uh, the answer turns out to be yes, and we are going to use uh, something that is called non-equilibrium unitaries in the, in, the, um, in the statistical mechanics literature. Um, we are basically driving our state out of the equilibrium with this unitary to, to a state that is not a thermal state. Um, and then we apply our exponential operator that's going to carry us um, to a purification of the target thermal state. Um, and then if you want that particular purification that I showed at the beginning, we, we need to apply this U star as well. And let's, again, in the similar way that we showed previously, let's show that applying this operator actually brings us to the target state, um, which is, again, you know, using this diagrammatic calculus, we can easily show this. So this basically works for any unitary U. But the problem here is that we want to find an efficient unitary U in such a way that this brings us an improvement. And the improvement we get is basically by changing the work cutoff value. By changing this U, um, we can basically change the work cutoff value from WL to WL prime, so we will need um, much less amplitude amplification rounds. But at each amplitude amplification round, we call now two additional operators, u and u star. So we need to make sure that, you know, we optimize the work cutoff value that improves this part. On the other hand, we also want to make sure that these are, these are efficient as well by themselves. Very quickly, a numerical result. Here we looked at transverse field easing model for, for small size systems. Um, this is the H0, this is the V. Uh, and this blue line is our algorithm without the, um, you know, the, it gives, you see the work cutoff value without uh, any non-equilibrium unitary. And, and as you see, it's getting pretty bad pretty quickly when the system size gets larger. But if you apply more and more, you know, slower, in a way, slower time evolutions, you are actually improving this work cutoff value more and more. And in the, in the very limit of adiabatic limit, uh, this work cutoff value is, um, is here. Um, so any of these improvements is actually exponential, right? Because this was coming as e to the minus beta wl over 2. Okay, to summarize, um, we saw an algorithm that basically generalizes all these previous algorithms. Um, instead of starting from the infinite temperature state, we can start from any other temperature, um, and we can perturb the Hamiltonian and we would need much less amplitude amplification rounds. Um, it is especially advantageous if the norm of V is much less than the norm of the original Hamiltonian, H0 and H1. Um, and we also seen that a non-equilibrium unitary may even further this um, the complexity of the algorithm. Um, so I, I didn't follow that line, but we could also motivate and, and see this algorithm as a 
quantum version of the rejection sampling. Um, and you know, if you want to understand how this algorithm is related to these metropolis type of approaches, um, maybe this is kind of the state of the art understanding there uh, that we can talk more about. Um, and some more op open questions are, you know, whether we can devise other quantum algorithms with similar line of thoughts, where you want to realize an operator, but when you make that operator a unitary, you get rescaled by, by a factor that is really high. You want to make that factor lower and lower. Well, maybe you can think of approximating that operator only within a certain subspace, and that actually may improve your, your rescaling factor. And another two questions are more about uh, you know, finding these good non-equilibrium unitaries and, and maybe finding analytical or beyond analytical bounds for the work cutoffs. Um, thanks a lot for listening. And I forgot Yeet is also here, and we are happy to take the questions. Questions? Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. So do you have a specific example on how large Z0 is? So I, it seems too good to be true to completely get rid of the dimension dependence. Yeah, I mean, Z0 may still depend um, exponentially in the number of qubits. OK. Yeah. Uh, do, do you have a specific dependence on the? Um, I, I believe one needs to go to the example to to get that right. You know, it, it's kind of case dependent. Okay. Um, but but I, I believe generically, it actually depends exponentially in the number of qubits. Okay. Thanks. It's, yeah. But it, it's all about the ratio, right? It's not only z zero, but but the ratio. Thanks for the nice talk. So, do you have an intuition on what these non-equilibrium unitaries are doing to the system? Yeah, so in this case, I think we looked at these um, adiabatic or nearly adiabatic evolutions. It's more like the, the comparison of this. Um, I, I don't know this part of the literature that well, but maybe it may... Um, yes, and this yeah. The ideal ones would take you from the basis of H0 to the basis of H1. So the best thing we can do is just change a basis between the target and the target. But the problem with that is that uh, that non-equilibrium unitary may then take a really long time because you are literally going from the eigenbasis of H0 to eigenbasis of H1. So you don't really want to use that. You want to use something in between. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, so I'm also curious about the, that Z0 over Z1 scaling. But what happens if you, because for example, if you start from ground state, it looks the round may be much smaller than one. It looks like because it can be exponentially small because you see. Yes, we still. Yeah, uh, we we are not claiming when when beta gets smaller and smaller, right? We still want to get our algorithm will still be exponentially hard. Yeah, but which is in. But that, that looks like it can be exponentially small. Like <laughs> it's much less than one, isn't it? Am I wrong? Um, because this, this ratio, yeah. So if you start from ground state or, or oh, Z zero. So Z one, uh, if it's the ground state. Z1 ah, so, is Z1 sorry. is one, right? There is only one state. Ah, so it's opposite. If Z0 is ground state, and if Z0 is no, no, Z0 is where you start from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Z1 is target. But why don't we? Why can we start from ground state of certain Hamiltonian? Oh, which is I see. Easy to prepare, so. Yeah. So, let's say ground state is easy to prepare. Let's start from there. Yeah. And Z0 is one. <laughs> um, yes, so it's, that's right. It looks very weird to me. So what's? Um, So the, the problem there is that if you start exactly from the ground state, you have zero support of any other state. 
So actually, you want to start from a state that is not exactly ground state, but beta is a little bit large. Be because the algorithm is not going to work if you don't have support on every state. Well, you can start yeah. from a ground state of different Hamiltonian. That's your claim. So, so why it's, can't you? Can't. I think starting exactly from the ground state is not going to work. So you need to think a little more but, in a way subtle that you, you just start from a really low temperature state. But any state, any pure state can be a ground state of certain Hamiltonian. So in, from, from that sense, starting from that ground state of Hamiltonian design B. I see, I see. So, yeah. so mm. I, I believe in that scenario, you are going to make this really complicated. Mm. So whatever you're gaining from here, it's going to be pushed to this. Yeah, can I maybe, chime in? Yeah, yeah. that may yeah. be an option. Yeah, another way to see it is that since we fixed beta, right, we normalized the Hamiltonian. So to get the, to start with the ground state, you would have to have a blow up in your H0. And then you, the perturbation would blow up because you would have to, yeah. you know, to single out one state, your H0 would have to blow up. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I agree, but there, so Z0 and Z1 are exponentially different, so opposite case can happen. So usually, like, numerator is exponentially large, that's a problem, but we can always invert and we have some examples. Right, right. But, yeah, what I'm saying is, yeah, the complexity in the square root would move into the exponential, okay. into the norm of V. Probably, yeah, probably that's the reason. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay, if that's satisfying. Okay, so thanks for the question. Let's ask, uh, thank Burak again. Thank you.